Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hello and welcome back to week two of our Nano Hub U course Introduction to Bioelectricity. I'm Professor Pedro Rothoki and let's just dive right in. So in week two, we're going to talk about the chemical basis of electrical signals. But to begin with, we need to understand what sorts of signals we're talking about. And so today, in this lecture, we're going to talk about TIC and DOC. TIC stands for transient inward currents, and DOC stands for delayed outward current. And so let's talk about where those come from and what those mean, and what sorts of things they tell us about the chemical basis of electrical signals. What sorts of things they, they, they tell us that will inform our exploration into how these various ion channels and neurotransmitters work at, at delivering postsynaptic potentials and action potentials and then combining into circuits which give rise to reflexes and thoughts and all sorts of cortical processing. So to begin with, let's talk about an instrument, the voltage clamp. So the voltage clamp was developed to understand the way that currents and voltages relate inside neurons. Specifically, if we take the axon of a giant squid, and the reason we take those axons is because they're large. And being large, it allows us to put electrodes inside them and outside of them. So we couldn't do that with your, with your axons or my axons because they're only a few microns in diameter. The giant squid axon can be quite a bit bigger than that. It can be a millimeter in diameter. And so we can put fairly large things inside and outside and measure the ionic currents through the, volt, uh, the neuronal, neuronal membrane. So if we use this circuit, we have a couple of amplifiers, a sensing amplifier, a resistor. And let's see how this works. Let's walk our way through it. So you have your axon, you have an electrode inside of the axon, and you have another electrode, a reference electrode, outside of the axon. And you're going to measure the difference in voltage from the inside to the outside. That's VM. That's the membrane voltage we've been talking about. You're going to measure that membrane voltage, and then you're going to compare it to a command voltage. The command voltage is anything you want it to be. And what it allows you to do is set, really, the membrane voltage. So with a command voltage, you can set it to any value. You can set it to minus 65 millivolts. You can set it to plus 20 millivolts. You can set it to anything in between or above or below. And when you set it, this amplifier will take the difference of the command voltage and the current membrane voltage, and it'll produce a current that'll flow back into the neuron and shift the membrane voltage so that the membrane voltage becomes the same as a command voltage. And when the membrane voltage is the same as a command voltage, there will be zero current flowing, and you'll have reached a steady state. And then there's one more piece to this puzzle, which is this resistor which has a sensing resistor RS, and the sensing resistor RS allows you to measure a voltage drop across it, VR, and we know that the command current is going to be equal to the, pro the, the, the voltage measured, the resistance measured, divided by the sensing resistor RS. That's just Ohm's law. So it allows us to measure the command voltage, and then here's the really important part. The command current is the current in. According to Kirchhoff's current law, you'll remember from your freshman year in physics, the current in always equals the current out. So we don't know what the membrane current is, but we know what the current in to the neuron is. And since the current in must equal the current out, the command current must equal the membrane current with a negative sign outside because the command current is flowing in and the membrane current is flowing out. So if we apply a command voltage, let's say we're sitting at minus 65 millivolts, and we apply a command voltage of zero, then zero minus minus 65 millivolts is going to give you a positive current, which will flow into the cell and depolarize it until the membrane voltage is equal to minus 65 millivolts. Or to zero, sorry. So let's look at some specific examples in which we use this tool, this voltage clamp, and it's called a voltage clamp because that's exactly what it does. So it clamps the membrane voltage to that command voltage. And we're going to vary the command voltage across different values, and we're going to see how that command voltage affects the ionic currents through the membrane. So let's look at 
this example first. So in this example, we're going to take a membrane that's polarized at minus 65 millivolts. That's the resting membrane potential for potassium. And the command voltage is going to be set to that initially. So there's going to be no current. And the membrane voltage and the command voltage are exactly the same. Now we move the command voltage to minus 130 millivolts. When we move it to minus 130, the voltage clamp will first measure the difference between the command voltage and the membrane voltage, and that'll be minus 130 minus negative 65 for a net of minus 65. So you'll have a negative command current. Negative command current, remember the current is the flow of positive ions or positive charges. The negative command current means that it'll be pulling positive charges out of the cell. And when it pulls positive charges out of the cell, the cell depolarizes until the membrane voltage reaches minus 130 millivolts, at which point you're back to having a command current of zero. In the middle here, you have this capacitive current. So remember that the membrane of the neuron is equal to a capacitor, right? You have this phospholipid bilayer, and you have a local uh, potassium charge on one side, and you have a local anion concentration on the other side, which give you a local negative potential inside the cell with respect to the local positive potential on the outside of the cell. So two walls of charge separated by an insulator, that's exactly what a capacitor is. So the membrane acts as a sort of biological capacitor. And when you want to change the voltage of that capacitor, you have to charge or discharge the capacitor. So what you see here is this short negative current that we would expect to be needed to hyperpolarize the neuron. So you see this short negative current spike, which then levels off at zero once the membrane voltage reaches the same voltage as the command voltage. Let's take another example. In this example, we're going to depolarize the cell, and this is a lot more interesting. So if we depolarize the cell, we're going to move the command voltage from minus 65 to zero millivolts. When we do that, the first thing that happens in our voltage clamp is that we compare the command to the membrane. Zero, which is the new command voltage, minus negative 65, which is the membrane voltage, is plus 65. So we're going to get a positive current, positive flow of positively charged um, particles into the membrane that's going to raise the potential inside the membrane to zero volts. So the membrane voltage will go from minus 65 to zero volts. And in that process, you're going to get this initial spike of capacitive current as current flows into the cell to raise the membrane voltage. But then something interesting happens. Suddenly, all by itself, you see two currents. You see a short current that goes into the cell. And when we say short, what we mean is that it's transient. It's confined to a specific time window. So you see this transient current into the cell, transient inward current, or initials, tick. And then you see this other current flowing out of the cell. This current is delayed, but it's not transient because it doesn't stop. It continues indefinitely, but it is delayed. It begins after a little while, and this delayed outward current, or dock, flows out of the cell. When we go back to our understanding of the action potential, we talked about how when an action potential begins, initially what you have is permeability to potassium ions, which give you the resting membrane potential. You switch permeability from potassium to sodium, and you have a short transient current into the cell, followed by switching permeability back to potassium, which gives you a second current out of the cell, which restores the resting membrane potential. And that's exactly what we see here. And in fact, the transient inward current is the result of sodium ions flowing into the cell, and the delayed outward current is the result of reverting the membrane permeability back to potassium and away from sodium and potassium ions flowing out of the cell to restore the membrane voltage. But here's the thing. Why is it that this delayed outward current never ends? The answer is because we've depolarized the cell to zero volts. So no matter how much potassium flows out of the cell, the membrane voltage is not changing because the membrane voltage is clamped to zero volts. That's the command voltage. And because the voltage never changes, you never get the electrophoretic field that would counter the diffusion force 
and give you a resting membrane potential. So you never get to resting. So you will have a delayed outward current that lasts forever. If we were then to revert the command voltage back down to minus 65, this delayed outward current would end. So to recap, recap, recall what we talked about, right? You have a membrane, it's semi-permeable, it's semi-permeable to potassium, and that gives you this rise in, in, um, in, uh, sorry, this resting membrane potential. You have a membrane which then becomes semi-permeable to sodium, sodium ions flow in, and potassium flows out. So this is all just the product of our original derivation of the Nernst equation and our intuitive understanding of that, first for potassium, then for sodium, and now back to potassium. So we can plot our action potential that we would expect to see, and we can break the action potential up into two distinct currents, a transient inward current of sodium and a delayed outward current of potassium. Well, there's a little bit of overlap, and this explains why the cell initially depolarizes, and the yellow potassium current explains why it repolarizes. So we can plot these uh, transient inward and outward currents as a function of different command voltages, and we've already done this for two. We've done this for going from minus 65 to minus 130, and we've done this for going from minus 65 up to zero. So let's look at a few more examples. So if we go from minus 65 up to negative 26, you're going to depolarize, but you're going to see a certain transient inward current followed by a certain delayed outward current. If you go all the way up to zero, you're going to see a larger transient inward current and a larger delayed outward current. Why is that? It's because ion channels are the sodium ion channels that we're interested in, the ones that are opening up. These are voltage-gated ion channels. So the voltage that they see determines whether they're open or closed. Now, an ion channel is never partly open and partly closed. It's not like a door in the sense that it can be ajar or all the way open. It's either open or closed. But whereas the ion channels are expected to open up at the threshold voltage, each individual ion channel has some variation around that precise threshold voltage. So if you take all of the ion channels together, you're going to have some distribution of voltages over which they open. And so as your depolarizing shift is further and further above the threshold, you're going to see a larger response as more and more of those ion channels slam open. So for a higher voltage, you'll see a greater response. If you increase the voltage further, the delayed outward current continues to get bigger, but the transient inward current now gets smaller again. And the reason for that is because now that you're moving closer and closer to the resting membrane potential for sodium, there's less and less of that transient inward current of sodium because the sodium is already seeing, almost from the very beginning, its own resting membrane potential and its own electric field counteracting the diffusion force of sodium into the cell. And in fact, if we go all the way to plus 52 and look at the transient inward current, we'll see that it goes to zero. And in fact, if we exceed plus 52 and we look at a command voltage of plus 65, where plus 52 is the resting membrane potential for sodium, if we look at plus 65, we see that we still have this delayed outward current and it's just gotten bigger. But now we have this little bump down here. This little bump down here, this is a small transient outward current of sodium. Because now that we've exceeded the resting membrane potential for sodium, sodium, even though there's a lower concentration inside the cell than out, there will still be a net flow of sodium out of the cell trying to restore the resting membrane potential for sodium. So by looking at these curves, you can tell what the resting membrane potential is of sodium. And from that, you can tell what the concentration gradient of sodium is. And you can tell which ion channels are open and when. You can do a similar set of experiments where you look at the, at the transient inward current, the delayed outward current, but this time you do it by varying not the command voltage, but by varying the concentration of sodium. So the concentration of sodium that you would expect to see in a squid giant axon is 460 millimolar. 
And if you have that concentration and you have a depolarizing um, shift and the command voltage from minus 65 to zero, you're going to see the early current and the delayed outward current. If you take away all of the sodium outside of the cell, so if you put this same neuron in a sodium-free bath, then when you get this depolarizing shift, the voltage-gated sodium ion channels will open. But what happens now is you have a higher concentration of sodium inside the cell than outside the cell. And so diffusion will lead to those ions flowing out of the cell to establish the resting membrane potential for sodium. So you'll have an early outward current followed by a delayed potassium current inward. Or outward, sorry. And if you put that same neuron back in or if you add uh, sodium to the solution, you'll restore the normal behavior that you observed originally. You can also test these um, this uh, segment of axon by looking at channel blockers. So if you want to know which currents belong to which channels, you can use specific toxins that block ion channels selectively. So for example, you can use tetrodotoxin, which is a sodium ion channel blocker. And if you use that, and you apply our depolarizing shift to minus 65 to zero, you'll see, normally you would see the transient inward current followed by the delayed outward current. If you apply tetrodotoxin to this axon segment, you'll see a tiny inward current of sodium followed by a normal delayed outward current of potassium. Now the question is, why do you still have any amount of sodium current if you've blocked the sodium ion channels? And the answer is because Sodium doesn't just flow through sodium ion channels. So if you remember in the last lecture, I talked about how some ions are permeable to sodium, some to potassium, and some to both. Well, this is how we know that there are ions that are permeable to both. So doing these sorts of experiments allows us to infer things about the anatomy and function of these axon segments. And this is how Hodgkin and Huxley discovered that there were ion channels that were semi-permeable to both. And whereas tetrodotoxin blocks the sodium ion channels, it does not block the channels that are permeable to both. And so you still have a small, much smaller, but you still have a transient inward current of sodium. If you use tetraethyl ammonium, that's a potassium ion channel blocker, you'll see that you have your transient inward current as sodium flows into the cell to give you that peak depolarizing voltage in the action potential, but you don't have the potassium current afterwards. And then finally, we can look at transient and delayed currents as a function of a variety of different values, where you look at, initially we looked at them plotted together, so you have with a low depolarizing shift, you're going to have a little capacitance current, a little transient inward current. With higher values, you're going to get more and more of the transient inward current, which then decreases as you depolarize directly to closer and closer um, the resting member potential for um, sodium. But the delayed outward current gets bigger for every value. And we can break these transient inward and outward currents, this membrane current, into the sodium and the potassium components. So we can see that the sodium gets larger and larger and larger and larger. However, this is the conductance of the membrane to the sodium. The flow, which is what we're measuring the moment when the membrane current, that becomes smaller. So even though the conductance to sodium becomes larger because a greater number of sodium ion channels have opened, the current itself becomes smaller because no matter how many sodium ion channels are open, sodium will not flow if you're already at the resting membrane potential for sodium. And similarly, if we look at the conductance of potassium ion channels, we can separate out the transient outward current from the number of channels that are open and from the, uh, uh, sorry, the delayed outward current from the transient inward current. And you can see that you have increasing amounts of conductance that lead directly to increasing amounts of delayed outward current. So for potassium, there's a one-to-one -one correlation between conductance and current. And that's because in each one of these cases, the potassium is trying to restore the resting membrane potential of minus 65. And in each of these cases, you're further and further and further away, so you're going to have a larger and larger and larger electric field driving potassium ions out of the cell. 
and away from the positive voltage inside the cell, in addition to a greater and greater con conductance, and that gives you the greater and greater current. So you have a different response for sodium than you do for potassium based on conductivity. And you can plot this, you can plot this conductivity of the membrane, the conductance of the membrane to sodium and potassium as a function of the membrane potential. And this highlights the point that I was making earlier about this distribution, this Gaussian distribution with which sodium ion channels and potassium ion channels open. So they have a threshold voltage at which they open. The sodium ion channels are voltage gated, the potassium ion channels are delayed. The sodium ion channels have this distribution, this high gain region in which there's a peak. Most of the ion channels open there. But for voltages that are below that threshold, you're going to get some ion channels opening. And for voltages that are way above the threshold, you get diminishing returns. So you don't get more ion channels opening at 40 millivolts than you do at 20 millivolts. But that distribution accounts for that variation in the conductance as a function of the command voltage. And that's where we'll end today. In the, lex in the next lecture, we'll begin looking at the specific ions that are involved in um, this process and the ion channels. And we'll begin looking at the ways in which these signals propagate down the membrane and tricks that the body has evolved in order to accelerate that conduction velocity. I'll see you then.